November 1872, the Atlantic experienced the worst weather since records began. 450 vessels were lost or abandoned at sea, but only one would become a legend, the Mary Celeste. She was found drifting 400 miles east of the Azores, seaworthy, her cargo well stowed, and with food and supplies for six months on board. It was not leaking. The sails were damaged. Those that were were up and had not been furled were damaged. Aside from that, there was no real structural damage to the boat. But ten people, the captain, his family and crew, had vanished without trace, leaving few clues as to their fate. They seemed to be navigating their way on fairly accurately throughout the, uh, throughout the voyage earlier on, and suddenly there's a deviation to the north. What secrets the Mary Celeste kept, she eventually took to a watery grave. And since then, many theories have been proposed. Some wilder than others, but none that fits all the facts, or could be proved by any means. Trying to understand why an experienced captain would do the one thing that really is unthinkable, which is to leave your vessel. An experienced person would do it only if you thought the vessel was going down. What follows is not the retelling of a famous yarn, or another theory without proof. An investigation for this program has found new information, including a transcript of the Mary Celeste's lost log. And now, with the help of a team of experts, the true story of the Mary Celeste can finally be told. New York, America's gateway to world trade. The city's pace has not changed in centuries, but its center of commerce has moved. Today, Business is conducted in tall buildings. In the 19th century, it was done on the city's docks, with more than 700 merchant sailing ships in harbor every day. It was a pretty rough trade. Nothing was sure, nothing was guaranteed. Uh, they improvised all the time. Uh, they would stay in a port until they found a cargo. They were the agents that found the cargo. Load up head off, try to find a cargo on the other end to bring it back. In the winter of 1872, storms in the Atlantic caused chaos. Sailings were delayed, wharves packed, and accidents occurred. On the Mary Celeste, an American registered brigantine, a new lifeboat was smashed. A replacement couldn't be found in port, and the captain would be forced to sail with only one on board. 37-year-old Benjamin Spooner Briggs was an experienced master, but this was his first voyage on the Mary Celeste. He believed he had a good ship, an experienced and peaceable crew, and though transporting alcohol, one of the most hazardous cargoes of the day, he was confident it was safe enough for his family to come along. A belief he would soon have cause to regret, and on the morning of the 7th of November, the pilot boat led the Mary Celeste out in a freshening breeze. No sooner had the ship reached the Atlantic than it was beaten by gale force winds. The soundness of its newly rebuilt hull tested by heavy seas. It's frightening, horrible stories of that. People who are caught in winter storms and the, uh, the boom would break, the sails would blow out, They're, they were beaten up by huge breaking seas in t several times. So you read about this over and over again. The crew lashed themselves to the mast so they wouldn't be washed away by the breaking waves over the hull. The Mary Celeste survived the rough crossing. And on the morning of the 25th of November, she passed here, six miles northeast of Santa Maria Island in the Azores. The last position recorded in the log. Ten days later, and 400 miles further east, the 
and Mary Celeste was observed from the day Gracia, a British brig. As in the scene recreated for a 1935 British feature film, the vessel was found unmanned. But unlike the film, the day Gracia's crew found no signs of life and decided to take the ship to Gibraltar, the nearest British port. There they registered a salvage claim, telling their story in the Vice Admiralty Court. The ship's crew disappeared, the ship was, a, uh, was found, the ship ship sailing uh, through the seas on its own. But what the men could not tell the inquiry was what happened to the ten people now missing from the ship. In fact, inquiry is almost a misnomer because the inquiry is far more interested in whether they can or can't give prize money to the members of the crew members of the De Gracia, rather than what actually happened to the crew of the Mary Celeste. Four months later, with still no news of their fate and no proof of why they disappeared, the inquiry ended with these matters unresolved. Today, when a vessel is found abandoned, investigators consider every aspect of the case, analyzing the known facts, searching for those that are missing, to discover the truth. You can see the pattern of trajectories is going eastward in the Did it follow the slope of the planks, or did it go from the yes. seam immediately above the waterline would be the one that of, of immediate concern. What are the pieces of evidence that we know that can guide us to understanding what happened? What is known comes from the few items that have survived, like this recently discovered photograph. It's the only image that exists of the Mary Celeste after she was taken into custody. The photographer was Horatio Jones Sprague, the U.S. Consul, who was one of the first officials to board the ship. There are also court documents, now preserved in government archives. This record is a handwritten transcript, which is often referred to as the Viva Voce evidence of what occurred. It's a transcript of what was of, of the oral testimony of the members of the crew of the De Gracia who found the, the ship and brought her into Gibraltar. But in 1872, the inquiry didn't have all the facts, and some of those they did have were misunderstood. Now, using recently found and vital new evidence, our team of experts unravels a frightening sequence of events which led to the disappearance of 10 people from the Mary Celeste. On the 5th of December, the crew of the De Gracia observed a strange vessel. It seemed to be in distress, and Captain David Morehouse halted calls to offer assistance. He was surprised to discover it was the Mary Celeste, which had left port eight days before his own ship, and by now should have been unloading in Genoa, not here, 400 miles east of the Azores. When he hailed the ship and no reply came, he sent a boarding party to investigate. Oliver DeVoe led the men. The first thing he did was to check the pumps and found one of them taken apart. Looking at it from a sailor's point of view, a historian's point of view, is that the sounding rod was out on deck. It was either for maintenance or something had gone wrong. The pumps extend from the deck down to the bilges, the deepest part of the hull. They remove seawater from leaks and seepage from cargo. You dropped a metal rod that you put, you put ash on and you dropped a metal rod on a lanyard and then withdrew it and you could see how far up the rod the ash was wet to your depth. Crews stored the sounding rod within the pumps or on the deck nearby. The reason it was on deck is so you could sound frequently wooden boats leaked and sometimes they would develop rather large leaks very quickly. Sounding the pumps, DeVoe found that the Mary Celeste had taken on less than four feet of water. Though I would have said that on a vessel of that type, knowing 
how her design was at the stern, that three and a half feet of water would not be a, um, a worrying factor. Confident that Mary Celeste was not about to sink, DeVoe went below. He found some cabins flooded. In the skylight, a pane of glass was broken. But beneath it was this rosewood harmonium. It belonged to the captain's wife, Sarah Briggs, and it was completely dry. The men found working charts. Missing were the ship's papers, navigational instruments, and maps. Personal effects did not seem to be disturbed. Topside, the crew found both masts secure. The sails set were torn, rigging in disarray, and missing the peak halyard, the longest rope on the ship. The cargo hatch was secure, but covers on two others were off. No lifeboats were found, but there was evidence one had been fixed to the cargo hatch. They both thought there had been a rapid departure. He couldn't tell when it happened, and he wasn't sure why. In Gibraltar, the authorities were suspicious. There seemed no reason why an experienced captain would leave a seaworthy vessel, unless he was forced to go. The inquiry began by investigating those who had the most to gain from the recovery of the ship, the De Gracia's men. Cross examining them was Gibraltar's Attorney General and Police Magistrate, the Honorable Frederick Sonny Flood. It comes through with Sonny Flood's lines of questioning. He's, he is convinced in his own mind that there was foul play. He was certainly very pertinacious. He sort of kept at it and uh, nosed away until he found something. The Attorney General ordered surveys and tests not usually done for a salvage inquiry. A descendant of Captain Briggs, Celeste Fowles, recalls one of the most controversial tests, an analysis of stains found on the ship and on an item of special interest to the court. There was a sword on board and he claimed that that had something to do with it. He um, speculated that murder was involved and that the crew of the De Gracia was somehow um, responsible. Oliver DeVoe admitted he had found the sword, drawn it from its scabbard, seen it had a rusty blade and thought no more about it. This is the uh, sword that belonged to my great-great-uncle, the captain of the Mary Celeste Benjamin Spooner Briggs, was uh, on board uh, when the ship was found. But what DeVoe called rust, the Attorney General believed to be blood. I used to play with it when I was a child, and so it uh, snicked up a little bit. In Gibraltar, a local doctor examined the stains. His findings backed up DeVoe's guess. The stains were rust, not blood. Comparing the logs of both ships, Mr. Solly Flood discovered that the De Gracia had sailed north of the Azores, while the Mary Celeste had taken a southerly route. He now accepted that the ships probably met where Oliver de Vaux claimed, but he was not convinced Captain Briggs left his ship before then, or of his own free will. Now the court weighed the possibility that the Mary Celeste's own crew had mutinied, speculating as to why they might have rebelled. The authority of a skipper, of a captain, on a vessel like that, was the authority of the hand of God. Uh, he could punish, uh, he could fire, he could withhold wages, but mutiny was always punishable by death. Uh, there are plenty of precedents for that. So um, there's no real reason on the face of it to think that, that there might have been a mutiny. Without evidence that the ten missing persons were victims of foul play, the court now considered if this was an insurance fraud. In New York, the owners of the Mary Celeste were notified that a salvage claim had been made. 
When insurers learned the ship's register was missing, they refused to pay out. It's always a very difficult legal question about salvage. You have to, um, you can't claim salvage if there's any indication that the people who abandoned the ship are going to come back. The principal owner of the Mary Celeste was Captain James Henry Winchester. To protect his interests and expedite his ship's release, he traveled to Gibraltar. At the end of the age of sail, wooden ships often figured in false insurance claims. Damage to the Mary Celeste's hull suggested this could be another. These are the only accurate drawings ever made of the Mary Celeste. They have been created from measurements taken for the inquiry by Gibraltar's surveyor of shipping and from other documents recently found. They indicate the position of almost matching damage to planks on the hull's port and starboard sides. Four senior British naval officers examined the Mary Celeste and agreed with Gibraltar's surveyor of shipping who described them as deep gouges which appeared to have been deliberately made. But could there have been another explanation for what happened to the hull? You know, we think of ships as, especially wooden ships for some reason, we think of them as having massive integrity, security, but they're very fragile. Wooden vessels do get damaged by coming into contact with other solid objects, whether it be the land or other vessels. When vessels are going slowly, they, 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 they come up and bruise and move away, but gouging I mean, we're, we're talking about probably a bit of speed here. Captain Winchester told the inquiry that the damage must have happened after the ship left New York. He proposed that when the Mary Celeste was recently rebuilt, new timbers, steamed and bent to fit the hull, were probably affected by heavy seas, which caused splinters to peel away. The U.S. Consul, Horatio Sprague, was anxious to bring matters to a close for the sake of the next of kin. He asked a visiting U.S. naval officer, Captain Robert Schufelt, to inspect the ship. Schufelt agreed with Captain Winchester about the splinter timbers, and in his report stated that he could find no reason why Captain Briggs should have abandoned his ship, except in a moment of panic. At the University of Massachusetts, Forensic scientist and wood expert, Professor Bruce Hoadley, considers evidence contained in all the reports. It would seem very unlikely that you would get a uniform width fracture which had a uh, sustained distance of six or seven feet. That doesn't sound at all to me like a natural fracture in a piece of wood caused by bending it. It is probable that the damage amounted to more than splinters. When or why they happened can still not be proved. But in Gibraltar, when rumors of an insurance fraud began to circulate, Captain Winchester left for New York without notifying the court. Did he leave because he had no confidence in British justice? Or did the Mary Celeste's owners have something to hide? Mary Celeste was built in Canada in 1860. First sailing under the name of Amazon, she was involved in a number of accidents, underwent major repairs, and was renamed Mary Celeste. Ten years later, she was acquired by J.H. Winchester, one of the most reputable shipping companies in New York. For two years, she gave her new owners good service, but by 1872, she was coming to the end of her working life. The ships that were steel, that had steam engines, tended to be more reliable, faster, and so they superseded the, uh, the wooden ships. So fewer and fewer sh wooden ships were being built and were out there. Most of those ships didn't last very long. If the vessel lasted maybe 10 or 11 years, it's like having an old car. You know, how much money are you going to keep putting into it after about the 10th year? Not much, uh, if it starts to to fall apart. Captain Winchester believed there was still money to be made from the Mary Celeste. And when a share became available, Captain Briggs bought in. Missing his family during long voyages, he planned to retire from the sea in a few years. Until then, 
he would be the Marie Celeste's master, take a share of her profits, and with alterations to the ship, his family could accompany him. A month before departure, the main cabin was enlarged. A second deck built to boost cargo space. This raised the Mary Celeste by five feet, adding four feet to the overall length, now 103 feet, which increased the ship's weight from 206 to 282 tons. On the Grand Turk, Marine Engineer Captain Ian McDougall is surprised no questions were asked about these changes during the inquiry. Today, to raise a vessel by five feet would be almost an unheard of uh, situation without immense calculations by the naval architects. I mean, even if, if on a ship like this, if we change the construction of our cannons from aluminium to cast iron, uh, we would have an immense uh, difference in our stability criteria. But in Gibraltar, the court could find no evidence that the Mary Celeste was unseaworthy, nor any other reason why ten people would leave the safety of their ship. In March 1873, almost four months after the inquiry began, Judge Sir James Cochrane ruled. He granted the salvage claim. The Mary Celeste and her cargo had been insured for $46,000. The salvers were awarded only a sixth of that. Evidence, some said, that the authorities did not believe their version of events. Were the crew members of the day garage for telling the truth? Because there may be an element of truth in what Solly Flood felt. Was there foul play? Did something go on? The day Grush's crew had risked their lives and their vessel to bring the Mary Celeste to Gibraltar. Disappointed by the way things turned out, they left and closed this chapter in their lives. But for others, a new one would begin 12 years later, when Arthur Conan Doyle wrote a short story which was inspired by these events. He changed the name to Marie Celeste, it's clearly the same vessel, and created a vast and really unpleasant racist story of African Americans rebelling and taking the ship to Africa, slaughtering the family. Conan Doyle went on to create Sherlock Holmes, the greatest fictional detective of all time. But instead of closing this case, his story had the opposite effect. Doyle, I think 50 years later, said he wished he'd never told the story. It had nothing to do with it. Neither the wreckage of the lifeboat nor remains of those on board were ever found. Without proof they perished, it was difficult for their families to give up hope that they may have survived. For Arthur, um, it was a big question mark in his life, a huge one, and something that um, while he was living, people had all kinds of crazy theories and speculations, and I'm sure it was hard for him to hear and to deal with. It may have been difficult for Captain Winchester as well, which would explain why he made a surprising claim after the publication of Conan Doyle's story. He now proposed that gases were produced by the ship's cargo of industrial alcohol. They mixed with foul air in the hold. Pressure built up, blowing the hatches off. Hearing fire or a massive explosion, Captain Briggs abandoned his ship. This theory was accepted by the next of kin, starting with the missing captain's brother, James Briggs. The whole family's interpretation of the story revolved around my grandfather. Some combination of weather concerns and fear that the alcohol was going to explode. Heat had caused the hatch to uh, blow off because the cargo was alcohol and uh, did not travel well in the heat and it got hotter off the Azores. But the facts did not support this theory then, nor do they today. When the Mary Celeste was found, her main cargo hatch was wedged and secure. The two hatches which were off did not give access to the cargo hold, but small storage compartments for sails, ropes, and other supplies the crew might take before abandoning ship. And weather records confirm there was very little difference between temperatures in New York and the Azores. It certainly wasn't enough to 
fake alcohol expand to the stage where it might explode if it could explode, which it can, unless it has some sort of body device. But uh, people have a lot of fun with this, with this theory of, uh, of the exploding alcohol. During the inquiry, investigators removed 50 barrels from the hold. 18 of these were opened, and all were found intact. None of the experts who originally inspected the ship found any proof that a fire or explosion had occurred. What new evidence did Captain Winchester have now? When the cargo arrives in Genoa eventually, um, nine of the 1,700 barrels of alcohol are actually empty. And it suggests that there was a leak of some sorts, um, that, there was, that this alcohol got out somehow. When the cargo was unloaded in Genoa, it was thought the nine empty barrels hadn't been filled properly in New York. But could the solution to this mystery have anything to do with how these barrels were made? The empty ones were all red oak, while the others were white oak. Can't say anything about the construction of the barrels, whether it was different or not, but there would be a difference in the timber itself, in that uh, red oak is a very different wood than white oak. As they grow, the two species look alike. It is only when they are cut and examined under a microscope that their different cell structure is apparent. These systems in red oak are open, and when the wood is harvested and dried, they remain open. In white oak, however, small bubble-like formations form in the vessels and this changes the permeability drastically. Professor Hoadley applies liquid soap to a piece of red oak. He blows air through it to demonstrate just how porous red oak is. And that surely shows how permeable the oak is to the passage of any gas or air or liquid that could pass through it. Barrels made of red oak were bound to leak, and they would have done so long before the Mary Celeste reached the Azores and their contents pumped out. But if the missing alcohol, some 450 gallons, remained in the hold, Oliver DeVoe would have smelled fumes when he first boarded the ship. He did not. In Gibraltar, the authorities had no reason to suspect the cargo was a factor in this case. Instead, they considered where the ship was abandoned, as this might offer vital clues. Crucial evidence was the last entry in the Mary Celeste's log, and where Captain Morehouse claimed the ships had met. Is it now possible to discover what happened between those two positions when, for almost ten days, there were no reported sightings of the Mary Celeste. At Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts, Dr. Phil Richardson studies ocean circulation. Knowledge that might have helped investigators in 1872, but based on data not available at that time. I was reading some historical books and discovered that in the 1800s, the uh, U.S. Navy Hydrographic Office was started putting out pilot charts of the North Atlantic. And on these pilot charts, they showed the positions of derelict ships. And a derelict ship is a ship that's been abandoned at sea. By analyzing these charts, Dr. Richardson has discovered that the drift patterns of 19th century derelicts are consistent with information on currents which is collected today using these high-tech drifting buoys. Once every 10 days they come up to the surface recording temperature and salinity and at the surface they send the data back via satellite. Dr. Richardson also counted more than 1,600 derelicts in the Atlantic by the end of the 19th century. 
And I was amazed to discover that there were more trajectories of derelict ships than, than, than I had of drifting buoys. Some vessels are known to have drifted thousands of miles, and for more than a year, especially if made of wood and still masted, like the Mary Celeste. Could she have sailed without a crew for ten days? This was an excellent ship. Uh, it was not leaking. The sails were damaged. Those that were were up and had not been furled were damaged. Aside from that, there was no real structural damage to the boat. So for presumably 10 days, it sailed itself. Um, if it had avoided major storms, there's no reason it couldn't have continued to do that, perhaps slowly taking on water. Today, comparatively few vessels are abandoned at sea. With his specialist knowledge, Dr. Richardson has helped to locate some that are. Could he calculate where the Mary Celeste sailed after reaching the Azores? I think it would be very difficult. Um, the simplest assumption you could do, and the winds are fairly well known that happened during the 10 days it was drifting, is you could assume that the Mary Celeste drifted downwind. Things tend to drift downwind. Without a crew and with her wheel unlashed, the Mary Celeste sailed with the wind and was carried along by ocean currents. When the Mary Celeste was discovered, the jibs were on a starboard tack. If you could convince yourself that the Mary Celeste stayed on a starboard tack the whole time, you might be able to recreate the, the track of the boat. Based on this assumption, an analysis of ocean currents and weather data from 1872 has indicated that this was the Mary Celeste's most probable track, a distance of 444 miles. But what evidence is there that Captain Briggs abandoned ships so near the Azores and so soon after the last log entry was made? Captain Briggs, I was going to put him down without a sense of caution. Separating from the ship is a very, very dangerous thing to do. You may not, unless you're near shore. The nearest land to the Mary Celeste course was Santa Maria Island, which rises 2,000 feet and could be seen from up to 20 miles away. With no safe harbor along the island's rocky coast, it is probable that the ship was abandoned within this arc. A clue which would have established this fact was missed by the Attorney General during the inquiry. But in 1884, now retired and still troubled by this mysterious case, Mr. Solly Flood returned to his notes. He wrote a summary of the case from interviews, and a transcript he made of the last five days of the Mary Celeste's log, which has been lost ever since. After his death in 1888, these papers were forgotten, until now. Did Mr. Solly Flood have the key to this mystery, after all? Disasters are a matter of bad timing. The critical moment when a number of events coincide with catastrophic results. After analyzing the Mary Celeste's law, Gibraltar's Attorney General suspected time itself was a factor in this case. He was puzzled why the log's calculations didn't add up and why Captain Briggs had taken three weeks to sail a distance which should have been covered in only two. Even experienced sailors like our Captain Briggs, they were constantly coming across uh, new and remarkable and, and frightening experiences, that, and they had to call upon their seamanship and their knowledge of boats and ships and weather to, to deal with, and sometimes they were taken by surprise. Now, for the first time, Mr. Solly Flood's papers confirm that the Mary Celeste, its cargo and crew, had come through the worst of the weather and survived unharmed until the 20th of November. It was what happened next that would seal their fate. Today, mariners use satellite technology to find their location and navigate their course, and can radio for assistance when lost. In 1872, Captain Briggs relied upon his experience and the navigational instruments he had on board. 
in particular the chronometer or sea clock, which measures distances east-west, every minute representing 15 nautical miles. Your chronometer is on board your ship and it's set to the off time you're put at port of departure. And then, you ha uh, when you want to know your, your position at sea, you then have to take local time, which you can do e most easily from the sun at midday. No chronometer was found on the Mary Celeste. Without any other explanation for errors in the log, the Attorney General inquired if there had ever been any on board. One, Captain Winchester testified. He said it was hired for the voyage and assumed Captain Briggs took it when he left the ship. Ships generally have more than, more than one chronometer. Um, some ships have as many as 20, but you'd, you'd probably have at least three uh, on board, minimum, minimum of three. And so you can, you, can check, you can check one against another. So if there is a fault with one, it shows up straight away. Having one chronometer um, isn't, isn't really a very good idea at all. Weather records indicate that the Mary Celeste encountered at least three major storms before the 20th of November. Had Captain Briggs held to an easterly course, he'd have met more of the same. Instead, he made a major course change, heading southeast. A deviation which took the ship away from bad weather, but also main shipping routes. That explained why there were no sightings of the Mary Celeste, but not why calculations in the log were accurate north-south, but east-west didn't add up. Was there a fault with the only chronometer on board? And if so, how and when did Captain Briggs find out? At some point or other, um, something's going to... Um, you're going to realise that something's going wrong, uh, presumably because you're not making, making the land that your chart should be uh, showing up. I mean, that, that would be the main thing. Once you're in the open sea, if the chronometer was seriously wrong, you could, you could carry on for days or weeks um, without, without knowing what was wrong. Captain Briggs reached that point on the 22nd of November when, contrary to his calculations, no land was in sight. Uh, the ship had been on a, on a, on a very rough voyage. Um, it was, I believe it was a hard instrument, and anything could have happened on that voyage. The discovery of Mr. Solly Flood's transcript has made it possible to analyse the ship's course. It has revealed that the chronometer was slow by as much as eight minutes. The Mary Celeste was 120 miles further west than Captain Briggs had thought, and could have led to the surprising decision he made on November the 24th. The uh, log shows the ship sailing southeastward south of the Azores for the previous several days, and only on the day before going to Santa Maria does it change course rather markedly to head and apparently go north of Santa Maria, which seems unusual. Unusual, because there are dangerous shoals north of Santa Maria. But at its northeastern point, there was the island's best anchorage, San Lorenzo Bay. Was Captain Briggs headed there? If so, why? If the island was known to the captain, and he was an experienced captain, maybe he sailed uh, directly for it, knowing you know, to, to get a, to get a positive reading, to, um, to know exactly where he was. Or did Captain Briggs fear for his ship? Was he seeking safe haven? A ship captain in the 1870s would have known he was sailing a flawed vessel. His expectations would not have been that high. Um, he was a cautious man, and he was sailing defensively most of the time. Never more than at 8 o'clock on the night of November the 24th, when the Mary Celeste met more bad weather. Winds of more than 35 knots, heavy rain, and very rough seas. Conditions which required all hands on deck, with no guarantees that they would be enough in this storm. The next morning, at 5 o'clock, the exhausted crew finally saw land. The log reported that Santa Maria was now only 30 miles away. For the next three hours, the winds reduced, but were still blowing at 20 knots. 
some crewmen could have sat. And now, there was proof that at least Sophia Briggs had a meal. In an interview never reported before, Oliver DeVoe told the Attorney General that he had found the mouldy remains of a child's breakfast on board. He saw no trace of other meals prepared or eaten, indicating that abandonment probably took place between breakfast and noon, and within sight of Santa Maria. The reason Captain Briggs might have abandoned ship here is clear. What isn't, is why. It used to be like an old adage that you never leave a vessel unless you have to climb upwards, which means that it's already sunk or, or, or sinking, you know, where you don't get into the life raft unless you have to climb upwards. You never abandon a seaworthy vessel until the last. It still gives you or affords you the best protection. Something made them think that the boat was sinking, that the vessel was sinking. Oliver DeVoe also believed that was why Captain Briggs abandoned ship. His best evidence, that one of the Mary Celeste's pumps had been taken apart and could not be used during the voyage to Gibraltar. Certainly the fact that one was out is quite an interesting uh, issue in a vessel that only had two pumps, so you're 50% down on your pumping. Mr. Solly Flood's transcript also confirms that Captain Briggs did have concerns about the pumps days before. Pumps always block up, even today they block up, and it, it depends entirely on how good you how to keep your ship. If the bilges are kept clean and uh, the limb spaces are kept clean, then there's really no, uh, there's no need or the, the, the ingredients aren't there to bung it up. Just before her refit in New York, the Mary Celeste carried a cargo of coal. A heavy residue of dust would have remained in the hold. The court did not consider the consequences of that dust, washing down into the bilges and forming a thick sludge with seawater during the voyage. Nor did it weigh the effects of the recent works done to the ship. But when you go in for a refit, or you've just had work done and you've had the carpenters with their shavings, and you've had the fixings, and whether it be nails or, or dowel pins, and all the kind of the dirt and the slurry that goes with a big job like raising it for five feet, you could easily have had stuff falling into the bilge. And you don't even know it's there. If they had found it, if they tried to pump and not much happened without much effect, then, then he would have started to thinking about abandoning ship. Cautiously. Captain Briggs couldn't be certain if the pumps were blocked and indicating that the Mary Celeste had taken on more water than she really had, or if hull planks had loosened in the storm and his ship was about to sink. Loaded to within inches of the deck, Captain Briggs had no way to investigate and made his next decision with the best information he had. A lot of the critical navigation gear was gone, which means they had time to collect it. And the, uh, the boat was gone from the uh, ship. The sails were left standing, the four sails, so they didn't drop those, they didn't stop. Um, so it does seem like there was a rapid um, evacuation of the boat but not instantaneous because they had time to gather their gear. He should have been able to get to the island, assuming he had no difficulty, within a couple of hours. Uh, he would have been prepared. There's nothing inherently dangerous about, about doing that, about going off in a small boat. With 800 miles of open sea before reaching Europe, and only one lifeboat that would be overcrowded with nine adults and a child. Captain Briggs would have seen this as the last and best chance they had to survive. All he can do then is to hope, as all of us would, is that that island up there uh, would be his next haven. And somewhere between that moment and reaching the island, uh, that little boat was overwhelmed by a sea or by a gust of wind, somehow, and sank. In his last letter home, Captain Briggs wrote that Sophia's favorite book was an album containing family photographs. No such volume was found aboard the Mary Celeste, 
nor has it turned up since. Perhaps, during those last frightening moments, realizing they would not be returning to their ship, memories of home were more precious to the Briggses than valuables they left behind. Those who stepped down from the Mary Celeste and into history and legend were victims of the times when profits were low and risks high. Sailing a ship past her prime, loaded to her limits, and without adequate equipment on board. In January 1885, the Mary Celeste under new owners was scuttled in an insurance fraud. Months later, Frederick Solly Flood completed his version of events, declaring this to be no episode of foul play or fraud, but a tragic accident after all. Today, the story of the Mary Celeste shows how far science and technology have come to prevent disasters at sea and investigate those which do occur. It is also a reminder of the great era of wooden sailing ships and the courage of those who sailed in them. In 1872, the Atlantic experienced the worst weather since records began. 450 vessels were lost or abandoned at sea, but only one would become a legend, the Mary Celeste. She was found drifting 400 miles east of the Azores, seaworthy, her cargo well stowed and with food and supplies for six months on board. It was not leaking. The sails were damaged, those that were were up and had not been furled were damaged. Aside from that, there was no real structural damage to the boat. But ten people, the captain, his family and crew, had vanished without trace, leaving few clues as to their fate. They seemed to be navigating their way on fairly accurately throughout the uh, throughout the voyage earlier on. As Load up, head off, try to find a cargo on the other end to bring it back. In the winter of 1872, storms in the Atlantic caused chaos. Sailings were delayed, wharves packed, and accidents occurred. On the Mary Celeste, an American registered brigantine, a new lifeboat was smashed. A replacement couldn't be found in port, and the captain would be forced to sail with only one on board. 37-year-old Benjamin Spooner Briggs was an experienced master, but this was his first voyage on the Mary Celeste. He believed he had a good ship, an experienced and peaceable crew, and though transporting alcohol, one of the most hazardous cargoes of the day, he was confident it was safe enough true story of the Mary Celeste can finally be told. New York, America's gateway to world trade. The city's pace has not changed in centuries, but its center of commerce has moved. Today, business is conducted in tall buildings. In the 19th century, it was done on the city's docks, with more than 700 merchant sailing ships in harbor every day. It was pretty rough trade. Nothing was sure, nothing was guaranteed. Uh, they improvised all the time. Uh, they would stay in a port until they found a cargo. There were agents that found the cargo. For his family to come along. I believe he would soon have cause to regret. And on the morning of the 7th of November, 
The pilot boat let the Mary Celeste out in a freshening breeze. No sooner had the ship reached the Atlantic than it was beaten by gale force winds. The soundness of its newly rebuilt hull tested by heavy seas. It's a frightening, horrible story. So that people who are caught in winter storms and the uh, the boom would break, the sails would blow out. They're, they were beaten up by huge breaking seas in t several times. So you read about this over and over again. The crew lashed themselves to the mast so they wouldn't be washed away by the breaking waves over the hull. The Mary Celeste survived the rough crossing. Suddenly there's a deviation to the north. What secrets the Mary Celeste kept, she eventually took to a watery grave. And since then, many theories have been proposed. Some wilder than others, but none that fits all the facts, or could be proved by any means. Trying to understand why an experienced captain would do the one thing that really is unthinkable, which is to leave your vessel. An experienced person would do it only if you thought the vessel was going down. What follows is not the retelling of a famous yarn, or another theory without proof. An investigation for this program has found new information, including a transcript of the Mary Celeste's lost log. And now, with the help of a team of experts, 